I've got a special video today. So this is the first from my Patreon math seminar. And so these are happening about once a month. And if you'd like to see them live, you can do that by signing up for my Patreon. And so today we've got Christopher Sadowski, who is from Ursinus College, and he's going to talk about what it's like to be a pure mathematician and a little bit about his personal research, which overlaps with mine. And one more thing before we get started. Chris has a YouTube channel of his own that I think everyone would be interested in. So make sure to go check it out, give him a subscribe and watch some of his videos. And now let's see his talk. Thanks for coming everyone and being part of this grand experiment to open up like kind of the seminars given at math departments all over the world to like the greater public. Um, <clears throat> I can't really thank you enough for being part of the Patreon and being part of this uh, little project that I'm doing. And I can't thank uh, my good friend, Christopher Sadowski enough for being this first speaker. Chris is uh, an associate professor at Ursinus College, which is right outside Philadelphia in the United States. We have a similar research area and we've actually co-authored a number of papers together. And so that's kind of how we know each other from the professional mathematics world. And um, maybe we both share kind of the identity of being um, two of like really the only active people in vertex algebras in small liberal arts colleges, which is like kind of its own difficulty. So I think maybe the, se the sequence of events uh, for today will be, we'll have Chris give his talk, then we can do um, questions about his talk and then maybe end with assorted questions if there are any. So with that being said, let's, um, I'll let Chris take it away from here. All right, sounds good. Um, yeah, thanks Thanks for the invitation uh, to speak. It's, it's kind of an honor to be uh, the first person to kind of speak in this grand experiment of these, these seminar talks. Um, so the talk I'm giving is a small journey into pure math and abstract algebra. So this is this is kind of a talk meant for a general audience. I will get a little bit mathy kind of throughout it and towards the end, but it, just the general structure of the talk is meant to be for kind of a more general audience to give a sense of kind of what pure math is and what abstract algebra is and how it's connected to number theory and things like that. Okay, so a quick outline. Um, first, I want to address the idea of what does someone working in pure mathematics actually do. Um, the way the way I'm going to address this is I, I actually gave a similar version of this talk at my college a few years ago and before I, you know, before I gave this talk while I was preparing, I went around and asked people like, what do you think I do as a math researcher? Or what do you think a math professor does? You know, um, and I got all sorts of answers and I kind of want to address some of those. Um, just kind of maybe like common, common guesses people might have. Cause I, I kind of realized that a lot of people don't quite know what a mathematician actually does. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about what is abstract algebra, um, kind of talk a little bit about groups and talk about other algebraic structures very broadly. Um, I'll talk about what is number theory, and in particular, we'll focus on integer partitions. Um, and then how are these areas connected and what does it mean for both disciplines? Kind of like, why am I interested in both of these areas? Okay, so to begin, what do people think I do as a mathematician? So here are some of the responses that I've gotten. Um, crunch numbers, really big numbers, right? I'm sure this, this, is, this is something I think mathematicians hear pretty commonly. You must add, like to add big numbers or multiply big numbers together or something like that. Um, solve hard equations, that's another common one. Um, statistical analysis of some sort, right? Um, people have this misconception that mathematicians are statisticians and those two things are very, very different oftentimes. Um, code and write algorithms. So that's another, another guess that I got from someone. Um, stare at a chalkboard and have brilliant insights. And I guess this is more like coming from, you know, popular media and movies and things like that. This is like how a mathematician gets portrayed in, in the media. Um, and balance bank books, you know, people, people sometimes think we do something like accounting or something like working with money or, you know, must be doing something like that. Um, you know, there's this common thing of like, oh, you're a math major. That must mean you want to be a teacher or an accountant or something like that. Right. Um, but there's, you know, tons of careers for, for people in math. Um, there's also, oh, teach math in grade papers, but what is there to research in math? Don't we already know everything? So that's, a, that's another, another really common response. So let's kind of address these briefly. Um, so crunch numbers, really big numbers. Um, usually not, usually if I have to deal with the big numbers, I use a computer, um, use like Mathematica or something like that to, to do the work for me. Um, 
solve hard equations. So sometimes and other times it suffices to prove that a solution exists. And sometimes if the equation is hard enough, a computer can solve it, right? I'll, I'll, I'll have a computer solve it or something like that. Um, but again, sometimes all you want to know is that a solution exists. Sometimes you want to actually know the solution. So that, that kind of varies. Um, but there are hard equations. Like that does come up from time to time. But that's kind of not like the root of everything. That's kind of like a consequence. You know, the existence of this hard equation might be like a consequence of some other work that you've done, which, which is kind of what I want to talk about. Statistical analysis. So I, I never do any statistics. Um, sometimes I'll gather data, but it doesn't help me prove anything, which we'll, we'll talk about what a proof is in a bit. Um, code and write algorithms. So again, similar to some kind of statistical analysis, um, coding will sometimes help figure out what's going on in a problem. Um, a computer might help me guess the general form of an argument or find patterns, but it doesn't solve the problem for me. It just might give me some hints as to you know how how to go about solving the problem in general, right? So it's kind of like evidence gathering. So this, this does play kind of a role, but it's not the primary thing. Um, Stare at a chalkboard and have brilliant insights. Well, half of that is accurate. I'll let you guess which half is accurate. Um, balance bank books. And my only question is, do people still actually do this? Um, I can't, I, I don't remember having, a, having to balance a bank book in a very long time, if ever. Um, and teach math and grade papers, but what is there to research in math? Don't we know everything? So yeah, I teach a lot. So I, I work at a small liberal arts college. So the teaching load is quite high and grading papers and the job is incredibly re rewarding. Um, but I also do work as a research researcher. So kind of let's talk about that. Um, so people, people can kind of guess how the teaching goes, right? You teach a class, you grade some papers, you meet with students in office hours, things like that. But what do I do outside of that? You know, what's the other kind of half of my job? <clears throat> okay. So what do I actually do? So I work in what's called pure mathematics. Um, that's, that's kind of uh, where my research area sits. So I do math for the sake of math, and I don't worry too much about applications to the real world. Now, you might look at that and say, well, doesn't that mean, doesn't that sound kind of arbitrary? Like, are you just kind of um, playing games with numbers or some kind of structures or something like that? So it turns out that these problems are not um, it doesn't mean that these problems are not important, and it doesn't mean that they're arbitrarily chosen. Usually, problems mathematicians study rely on other interesting problems people have solved in the past, and those problems might be motivated by something in the real world or, um, you know, something like that. So, you know, or, or maybe they become useful later on, right? One famous example of this would be um, uh, non-Euclidean geometry was developed in the 1800s, and it didn't really find a use until the theory of relativity came along with Einstein. Um, several decades later, um, so that so so the, these two kinds of things, it's 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 um some of them are intellectual exercises, but you know some of them become useful, some of them don't. Um, but all the problems are typically motivated by some past problem or some past idea, right? A lot of a lot of the questions are like, well, what if I remove some assumptions, or what if I change some assumptions? What ends up happening? And usually those those changes you make are quite natural. Um, the 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 ideas I work with have overlap with ideas. In, and problems in theoretical physics, namely like string theory and conformal field theory. Now, the thing is, I'm not a physicist, I'm not trained in physics, so I can't really comment too much about these fields, but I know that um, these, there, there is overlap in you know the type of research. So there are papers by physicists that talk about the same structures that I do. Um, physicists come to the same conferences that I do. So there, there's overlap there. Um, there are also, so these problems are also interesting to mathematicians in other fields, in particular number theory. And that's kind of what I want to address today. Um, talk a little bit about abstract algebra, so maybe, uh, you know, very broadly, some of the stuff I've worked on in the past and how is it connected to number theory. Um, and a lot of the work involves reasoning and logic and not number crunching, right? So a lot of it, I would kind of compare to maybe like a logic puzzle of some sort. Okay, so since I'm talking about logic puzzles, let's start with a small logic puzzle. So I kind of want to use this logic puzzle as a way to explain how a mathematician might approach a problem, right? Um, so we're going to start with this eight by eight chessboard, so standard chessboard. And the first question I'm going to ask is, can I take two by one dominoes and cover this entire chessboard without having any pieces hanging off the board, right? And so, and each domino covers two squares. So you might think about this and be like, oh yeah, that's pretty obvious right? You might do, okay, well, what if I just lay the dominoes out like this in the following way? And okay, great, we've solved this problem, right? I've taken this two, this eight by eight chessboard, it's got 64 squares, and I've covered it in two by one dominoes, right? So there's 32 dominoes there. 
Um, so let's let's tweak this problem a little bit. A mathematician might say something like, well, what if I remove one of the corners? All right, so say I take this chessboard and I remove the top right corner. So I've colored it red to indicate that it's been removed. And now the question is, can this be covered by two by one dominoes where each domino covers two spaces without any of them hanging off the board? And you might think about this for a second and say, wait a second, now there's an odd number of squares and anytime I put down a, a domino, I'm always covering an even number of spaces. So you might say, of course not, there's no way to cover an odd number of squares, right? There's, there's 63 spaces and each domino covers two at a time, right? So that last domino is gonna have to hang off the board somehow. Okay, um, so that's not that interesting. It's not that difficult of a problem. Um, but what is difficult is, well, what if I remove the top right corner and the bottom left corner? So now I have an even number of spaces and I wanna cover this board with two by one dominoes again, right? And so let's see what happens when we try to cover it with dominoes, right? So let's try. So I'm going to start placing dominoes on this board and let's see what happens. And again, this is just one configuration of dominoes. There's all sorts of configurations I would have to check, right? So we can place these dominoes. Maybe I'll speed this up a little bit. And what I'll notice is that when I place these dominoes, I fail, right? Now there's these two squares left over and this fails miserably. And I might notice that no matter what configuration I try, this is always going to fail. Um, so in fact, anything we try will fail miserably. So one way of tackling this problem, you know, one kind of like, I, I, I don't, I guess I'll call it like a naive way or like a first approach would be, let's get a computer to generate every single possible configuration of these dominoes and show that they all fail, right? And you can imagine that this is pretty inefficient. There's a lot of configurations you'd have to generate. Um, so then you might start asking yourself, wait, is there a more elegant way to solve this problem? Um, one thing you might notice is that no matter what configuration you choose on this board, there will always be two black squares left over. So no matter how I place these dominoes, there's always going to be two black squares left over. So that might give you a hint as to um, a proof of the statement or some of the logic behind it. So here's a proof, the elegant proof. So each domino, when we place it, it covers one white space and one black space. Notice that when I remove the two corners, I remove the top right and the bottom left, I've removed two white spaces. So now I have 32 black spaces and 30 white spaces. So what's gonna happen as a result, when I place my dominoes, I'm always gonna cover exactly 30 black spaces and 30 white spaces, and I'll have two black spaces left over. Remember, each domino has to cover a white and a black. There's no way to cover, use a domino to cover two black spaces at the same time. Um, so. As a result, it's impossible to cover this board with dominoes. Um, what's really cool about this, it turns out that um, we can now pose this problem for a larger chessboard, right? So say I wanted a chessboard, instead of eight by eight was a thousand by a thousand, or a million by a million, or a trillion by a trillion. Um, it turns out the same argument works. Anytime I choose an even number by an even number, um, the same idea will work and show that it's impossible. If I remove the top left or the top right corner and bottom left corner, it's going to be impossible to cover this board, right? Had we taken our computational approach where we generate all possible configurations, you might think, okay, that's going to be super inefficient for a trillion by a trillion chessboard, right? That computer might not even finish generating all those configurations. Um, but this beautiful argument covers, you know, covers all possible cases where you have an even number of sides by an even number of sides. Right? And this is a much shorter, much cleaner, much more elegant argument. So as mathematicians, a lot of times we'll search for arguments like this. Right? A, a lot of our problems are like logic puzzles, and we want to search for log logical arguments um, that allow us to solve these problems. Um, OK, so what is abstract algebra? So <clears throat> let's talk about this a little bit. So abstract algebra is the study of algebraic structures. So let's talk a little bit about what these are. Um, so here are some common algebraic structures. I'll give some names and I'll talk a little bit about what they are as we go. So groups, they arise in the study of symmetry and sets with one operation. So you might think of like the integers with addition defined on them or the positive reals with multiplication defined on them or something like that. Um, rings is the study of sets with two operations. So we have addition and multiplication and we study their properties. So you might consider integers with addition and multiplication or rational numbers or real numbers or complex numbers. Um, you might consider two by two matrices with addition, matrix addition and matrix multiplication. Um, these, these will all fit the structure of a ring. 
Um, vector spaces and algebras. So this, these arise from the study of vectors, systems of equations, and matrices. If you've ever taken linear algebra, you would encounter uh, vector spaces. We'll talk about algebras a little bit too, because they're not they're not too far off from vector spaces. Um, then there's also more complicated structures, which we'll talk about briefly: Lie algebras and vertex algebras. So these are special examples of algebras, um, and they arise from deeper areas of math and theoretical physics. Okay. Um, so these and many others fall under the umbrella of abstract algebra. So this is not a com comprehensive list by any means. There are all sorts of algebraic structures that fall under this umbrella of abstract algebra, but these are some common, common structures that people would study. Um, so a little bit of group theory. Um, hold on, I have to hide this a little bit because the zoom window is in the way. Okay, so a little bit of group theory. Um, so we're going to consider the following eight symmetries. So I'm going to take this figure here, this pi, and I'm going to consider some rotations of this figure. So for example, I'm going to first rotate by zero degrees. So pi just stays as itself, it's pi. Um, then I can rotate it counterclockwise by 90 degrees, and I'll get this shape. Um, I can rotate it by 180 degrees, and I'll get this shape. I can rotate it by 270 degrees counterclockwise, I'll get this shape. Um, so those are four symmetries of, of this shape, or four, four operations I can perform on this shape. Um, then I can do a few other things. I can flip across a horizontal axis. So this horizontal axis is kind of through the center of the figure. And when I do that, I get this version of pi. Um, I could flip around a vertical axis. I'll get something that looks like this. I can flip about the main diagonal and I'll get something that looks like that. So you can imagine I'm, I'm using this diagonal as a mirror and flipping pi across that diagonal. And then I can flip about the other diagonal and I'll get something that looks like this. And where are these symmetries coming from? I'm using this figure of pi um, because it's kind of it makes it easier to see what's what's going on. But what are these symmetries? These are symmetries that would preserve a square. If I take a square and I rotate it by 90 degrees, I have a square. If I take a square and rotate it by 180 degrees, I still have a square. If I take a square and I reflect it across a horizontal axis, I still have a square. So these symmetries are just the symmetries that were that would preserve a square. Um, I might notice that I can kind of perform some of these actions in sequence, right? Maybe I want to, you know, rotate by 90 degrees and then do a horizontal flip. So let's kind of examine this. Um, so for example, we can, like I said, we can rotate the square, we can rotate by 90 degrees and then reflect it horizontally. So if I take this pi and I rotate it by 90 degrees, I'll get something like this. And then I can take that resulting figure and flip it across this horizontal axis and I'll get a figure that looks like this, right? Then I might notice, wait, wait a second, that figure on the right hand side looks familiar. That figure on the right hand side, I could have just gotten it by flipping across the main diagonal, right? It's the same figure I would have gotten had I just flipped across the main diagonal. So in some sense, rotating by 90 degrees and flipping along a horizontal axis is the same as just flipping along the diagonal, right? So we have this way of composing two operations and producing an operation we already know. Um, so what, we, what we're going to write, if you look at the bottom left over here, is we'll say that h times r90 is equal to d. And the idea is we apply r90 to our figure first, and then we apply h second, but that's the same as just applying d. Right? So these could have been done in, in, you know, with, with just one operation, with this operation d. And what we can do is we can make a table, like a multiplication table, uh, or sometimes called a Cayley table, of all of these operations. I could say, well, what if I just take all these operations and start applying them to one another? Um, one thing we might notice is that if I rotate by zero degrees and then do any other operation, it's the same as doing that original operation. Um, I might notice that my h times r90 appears right here, right? h times r90 is equal to d. That's the operation we just saw. Um, I might ask the question of, well, what if I do, what if I do the horizontal flip and then a 90 degree rotation, right? We would call that r90 times h. Um, so I would get d prime. Right, I would get the a flip along the other diagonal. So I notice that h times r90 is equal to d, but r90 times h is equal to d prime. Right. So one thing I notice is that this operation, th this composition is not commutative. Right. Um, it matters what order I apply these operations. And we're used to our operations being commutative, um, like addition and multiplication and things like that, typically when you're working with numbers. Um, but in this structure, they're not commutative. Um, Another thing I might notice, like I pointed out earlier, R0 leaves anything it's applied to unchanged. So we're going to call R0 the identity element, right? So if I do a 
horizontal flip and then a zero degree rotation, that's the same as just doing a horizontal flip. So R0 times H is just H. R0 times V is just V. And similarly, V times R0 is V. H times R0 is H, right? So R0 is called the identity element. Um, it plays the same role as like multiplication by one would in, a, in the integers, right? If I multiply an integer by one, that integer remains unchanged. Um, finally, I noticed that any operation can be reversed or inverted, and we're gonna call this property invertibility. So if I do a horizontal flip, and I want to reverse that horizontal flip, I just do the horizontal flip again and I get back my original figure. Um, and that's true for any of these uh, flips along the horizontal axis, the vertical axis, right? So one thing I might notice is that H times H is equal to R0. I might notice V times V is equal to R0. Uh, D times D is R0. So if I apply a diagonal flip and then apply that same diagonal flip again, it's the same as just doing nothing at all. Um, I might notice that, how do I reverse a 90 degree rotation? Well, I rotate by 270 degrees, right? So I might notice that R90 times R270 is the same as R0. It's, it's the same as just doing nothing at all because I've done a 360 degree rotation, so I've, I'm back to my original orientation. Um, so what, what can we glean from this? Well, a group is a set and it has an operation defined on it and it has the following properties. Um, the first property is closure. If I combine two elements in my set, it gives me back an element already in the set. So the way to think about this is I had these operations, these like horizontal flips and rotations and things like that. When I combine them with one another, I, when I mul you know, multiply them or compose them, um, I end up getting back an element that I already have in my set, right? So H times R90 was equal to D and D was already in my set, for example. Um, so this is, this is a property called closure. Um, there is an identity element that leaves things unchanged under this operation. So there's an identity element in group theory. It's typically called E, usually a lowercase e. I'm using caps here just for kind of for clarity. Um, but basically I want A composed with E to equal A and E composed with A to equal A. So in our example from earlier, R0, the rotation by zero degrees, is our identity element. If I perform an operation and rotate by zero degrees, I've basically left my structure unchanged. I have invertibility, so any element can be inverted. That is, given some element A, there's some other element B such that A times B gives me my identity element, and B times A is my identity element. Um, so I can, in, in our example from earlier, I can always get back to R0. I can always take an operation and multiply it by something to reverse that operation and get back to R0. Finally, we have associativity. So this is kind of something you'd have to manually check. Um, a times B times C is always equal to A times B times C. Okay, what are some other examples of groups? So a group is any set with an operation defined on it that satisfies these four rules or these four axioms. Um, another example of a group. So this is a very common example. The set of integers, so um, zero plus minus one plus minus two plus minus three, so on and so forth. Under the operation of addition, this forms the this, this has the structure of a group. So closure, let's think about this. If I add two integers, I always know I get another integer. So I know this operation is closed under addition. Um, identity, so zero is the identity element. I know that a plus zero is always equal to a, and zero plus a is always equal to a, right? So zero leaves, leaves uh, my integers unchanged when I add it to those integers. Um, invertibility, if a is an integer, we know negative a is an integer. And I know a plus negative a gets me back to my identity. a plus negative a is equal to zero. So I have that um, any integer can be inverted under addition. And then finally, associativity. We know that the integers, integer addition is associative. Okay, what about another example? Well, if you're familiar with linear algebra, you might have come across invertible matrices. So the set of n by n invertible ma matrices, let's say with real entries. Um, and the operation will be matrix multiplication. Well, why is this closed? I know that if A and B are invertible, then the determinant of A times B is determinant of A times determinant of B. And since A is invertible, determinant of A is non-zero. Since B is invertible, determinant of B is non-zero. So I get that the product of two non-zero real numbers is non-zero. So determinant of AB is non-zero, which means that AB is invertible. Right, that's one way we can show that A times B is invertible. So I know that if I multiply two invertible matrices, I get an invertible matrix back. I get back something in my set.
Um, the identity element is just the identity matrix. So it's the matrix that's zero everywhere except on the diagonal. On the diagonal, it's equal to one. Uh, invertibility, well, we're assuming our matrices are invertible. So if A is invertible, we know A inverse is invertible. And we know that A times A inverse is the identity and A inverse times A is equal to the identity. Finally, associativity, something you typically see in linear algebra is that matrix mu multiplication is associative. So this is something you would prove in a linear algebra class. It's a little, a little bit tricky, but not too bad. Um, so these are just some examples of groups and there are tons and tons and tons of examples of groups. But the idea is it's a set with an operation and it satisfies these four axioms. Okay, um, a bit about terminology. So you might notice I'm calling this group theory. Right? So the word theory in mathematics is not used in the same way as it is in the sciences. Right? So our approach in math is not to do experiments or gather data to support a hypothesis. I mean, we sometimes do this, but it never actually proves anything. Um, so it's not enough to show that a result is true. So you can give me a billion pieces of data to support your claim. I won't count it as a mathematical proof. You can give me a trillion pieces of data to support your claim. I will not count it as a proof. Um, this kind of information gets you a conjecture. So a conjecture is a guess that something is true, but it hasn't been proved yet, but it doesn't get you a theorem. A theorem is a statement that has been proved. Um, what we do to prove theorems is we explore logical consequences of our axioms and assumptions. And those logical consequences are called theorems. Um, and we write formal proofs. So it's not enough to show that something, if you wanna show something is true for all integers, you have to show that it's true for any integer you choose. It's not enough to show that it's true for like the first trillion positive integers or something like that. Um, in many ways, this brings math, uh, pure math closer to logic and philosophy. Um, if, you've, if you've ever done any philosophy, the way you would see um, someone like Socrates argue, um, it, it kind of feels like you're reading a math proof in some ways. Um, you have your set of assumptions and you're reaching logical conclusions from those assumptions. Um, in mathematics, a theory, again, is just the logical consequences that follow from a set of axioms and assumptions. And the axioms or assumptions that you're making, they're the building blocks. So our axioms in this case are those four rules that I stated. So it, I have a set with an operation that's closed, has identity, has inverses, and is associative. And then I, build, I, I try to explore it. Well, if I have a set with these four properties, what can I prove about this set, right? And that, that would be the, the theory of groups. Um, so group theory is just the study of the consequences of the group axioms, those four axioms from earlier, as well as the structures which obey these axioms and their properties. Okay, um, so other algebraic structures, let's talk about these. So a group, like I said, is a set with one operation satisfying the axioms we mentioned earlier. You might say, okay, well, when I studied math, I remember we added numbers and multiplied numbers. Does that thing have a name? Well, yeah, it's called a ring. So a ring is a set with two operations defined on it, often called addition and multiplication, and they have their own axioms, right? So the idea is that um, under, under addition, you form a group, and it's actually a commutative group. A plus B is always equal to B plus A, and then multiplication has its own axioms. Um, and then you have these two operations are connected by a distributive law, namely that A times B plus C is A times B plus A times C, and A plus B times C is A times C plus B times C. Um, uh, an example of, uh, an example, an important example of a ring is what's called a field. So a field, one way to put it is it's uh, what's called a abelian group or a commutative group under addition. And if you remove the additive identity, if you remove the zero element, um, you get an abelian group or a commutative group under multiplication. Um, a vector space. Um, so this is also an algebraic structure that mathematicians are interested in. And this is something you encounter in linear algebra. So a vector space is a set of objects we call vectors. And the two operations we have are addition and scalar multiplication. So I could always add two vectors and create a new vector. And I have this operation of scalar multiplication where I could take a vector and multiply it by some number from a field. So like the real numbers or rational numbers or complex numbers. Um, in the sciences, vectors are often drawn as arrows. So if you've taken an introductory physics course or something, you might draw vectors as arrows and then you can add vectors by drawing the right kind of arrows. Um, you can take a vector and rescale it. So if I multiply it by some number, it might make the vector longer or shorter. If that number is negative, it might flip the vector to face the other way, right? It might flip it 180 degrees. Um, so it might change their orientation. Mathematicians will often study vectors in a much more abstract setting. So we don't often draw arrows or things like that. Um, 
In particular, a vector space is a set of objects which can be added, so it's an abelian group or commutative group under addition, and can be multiplied by scalars. And there are some rules that these these objects must, or that these operations must satisfy. Um, and they're, again, they're connected by some kind of distributive law and so on and so forth. Um, what is an algebra? An algebra is a vector space where we can multiply vectors together. So now we have three operations. We have addition of vectors. We can take a vector and multiply it by a number or by a scalar and we can multiply vectors as well. So what are some examples of these? Well, you can show that n by n matrices over the reals, for example, form a vector space, but then you might notice that, oh, I know how to multiply matrices too. I can you know, multiply two n by n matrices and create a new n by n matrix. Um, so the set of n by n matrices would be an example of an algebra. Um, another example would be the set of polynomials with coefficients that are complex numbers. Um, I can take two polynomials and add them and create a new polynomial. I can take a polynomial and rescale it. I can multiply it by another complex number. And I can multiply two polynomials and create a new polynomial. So I have these three operations. Um, Lie algebras are algebras whose multiplication is neither commutative nor associative. So Lie algebras are kind of weird. The, the operation is usually written using a bracket. Um, but for this talk, I've just written as a normal multiplication. So in a Lie algebra, so it's basically a vector space and I have a way of multiplying vectors, um, I'm gonna assume that A times A is always equal to zero. So if I multiply any element against itself, I always get zero. And I don't have associativity. I have A times BC is equal to AB times C. So if I had just included these first two terms, I would have associativity. Um, but there's also this extra term of B times AC. And, you might, and this last equation is often called the Jacobi identity. Um, you might ask, well, what's, what's an example of this? Well, if you remember from multivariable calculus, you might have seen R3. R3 is an example of a vector space. R3 with the cross product is an example of a Lie algebra. So the cross product, like u cross u is always equal to zero for any vector u. And the cross product obeys this kind of, this kind of equation, right? So that's, that would be an example of a Lie algebra. Um, Finally, a vertex algebra. I'm not going to get into too much detail with this, but a vertex algebra is a vector space, and it's not it's not an algebra in the technical sense that I've just defined. It's actually a vector space with infinitely many multiplications. So it's not it's called a vertex algebra because it kind of behaves like an algebra, but it's not an algebra in the strict sense. Um, the rules that they satisfy are pretty complicated, so you have these infinitely many multiplications. Um, so we're not going to list them here. Okay. So that's a little bit about what abstract algebra is or what kind of things fall under this umbrella of abstract algebra. Um, what about number theory? Let's talk about some ideas from number theory. Um, so a little bit of number theory. So you might ask, well, what is number theory? Number theory is the study of the integers. Um, you study integers, related structures and ideas, and there are all sorts of questions. Um, here are some examples of things that you might ask if you're a number theorist or if you're studying number theory. You might ask, can the sum of two squares be a square? And the answer to this is yes, right? This is often referred to as Pythag the Pythagorean theorem, and these numbers are called Pythagorean triples. So for example, three squared plus four squared is equal to five squared. So the, the sum of two squares can be a square. Um, can the sum of two non-zero cubes be a non-zero cubed? So if I wanna solve a cubed plus b cubed, can that ever equal c cubed? And the answer to this is no, um, but this is a bit trickier to prove, so this can be proved. Uh, the generalization of this is known as Fermat's last theorem, but with cubes, it's it's not too hard to show. I mean, it's 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 a bit intricate, um, but the sum of two non-zero cubes can never be a non-zero cubed, right? That's well known. Um, are there infinitely many primes of the form n squared plus one? So this is actually a question that's an open problem. We don't know the answer to this. If there are infinitely many primes of the form n squared plus one, another way to formulate this is are there infinitely many primes such that, or let's say infinitely many primes p such that p minus one is a perfect square? Open problem, don't know the answer. It's very simply stated. So it's, it's very easy to get into this territory with number theory where you run into a problem that's very easy to state and very, very hard to solve. All right, so this is, this is one of these types of problems. Another problem is are there infinitely many primes p such that p plus two is also a prime, All right? This is called the twin primes conjecture and the answer is we don't know. Um, so we can think of primes like this, like three and five, right? They're primes that have a, a gap of two between them, uh, 11 and 13, seven and nine, 17 and 19. Um, these are all primes, you know, if P is equal to 17, then P plus two is 19, they're both prime. But does this pattern continue? Are there infinitely many pairs of primes like this? 
We don't know. Still wide open. But these are the types of problems that a person in number theory might think about. Um, so number theorists also study things like prime numbers, structures arising from the integers, and generalizations of the integers. Um, integers can be studied using all sorts of methods. Um, one, one branch of number theory is called analytical number theory, or analytic number theory, and they use real and complex analysis. So some of the theorems that have arisen from analytic number theory might include the prime number theorem, the Riemann hypothesis, the study of modular forms, things like that. So anytime you're involving complex analysis, um, you're doing uh, analytic number theory. And it's actually a beautiful field. I, if, if you haven't looked into it, I really encourage you to look into it. I remember I took a course in this when I was a graduate student. I honestly felt like I was watching magic being done in front of me. That, that, that's always been my impression of analytic number theory. It's an absolutely beautiful field. Um, there's algebraic number theory. So this is a branch that uses the techniques of abstract algebra to study the integers. So you use things like rings and fields and their properties to study the integers. So you kind of um, don't use the analysis side. You use more, more ideas from abstract algebra. Um, and another branch is the theory of integer partitions, which is what we're going to discuss in this talk. Um, so this involves ideas from both num number theory and combinatorics. OK, so this is kind of what I want to focus on. So what is an integer partition? So one thing you might recall is that uh, the positive integers are numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so on and so forth. Um, and what is a partition? A partition of, of, of positive integer n is a way of writing it as a sum of smaller positive integers where the order doesn't matter. So for example, I can partition 5 seven different ways. I could say 5 is equal to 5. I can say 5 is equal to 4 plus 1. I can say 5 is equal to 3 plus 2. I can say 5 is equal to 2 plus 2 plus 1. The idea is I want to write 5 as a sum of smaller positive integers. Um, I can write 5 as 3 plus 1 plus 1. I could write 5 as 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Or I could just write it as 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. And I'll count something like 3 plus 2 and 2 plus 3 as the same. So I'm, I want to make sure that order doesn't matter. So a lot of times I'll fix an order. I'll write them in decreasing order or increasing order. Um, because again, something like 3 plus 2 is the same as writing 2 plus 3. Or something like 2 plus 1 plus 2 is the same as writing 2 plus 2 plus 1. All right, so we, we don't want these kinds of repeats. Um, but the thing to notice is he here is that there are seven ways of doing this, and this exhausts all the possibilities. Um, these smaller numbers that we encounter in our partition, we're going to call parts. So like in this partition 3 plus 2, the 3 and 2 are parts of the partition. Um, here, the parts are 1. So this 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. These, are, these parts are all 1. So those are, that's what we call these smaller numbers. Um, we're going to use the function p of n to denote the number of partitions of n. So for example, uh, p of 5 is equal to 7. Right? The number of partitions of 5 that we have is 7. Um, so here are some important questions in number theory. How many partitions does any number n have? This is a very, very difficult problem, believe it or not. Um, if I restrict the types of parts I'm allowed to use, does anything interesting happen? For example, if I want to use only odd parts or only even parts or something like that, does anything interesting happen? Um, and uh, the, the question you might really be asking is, is this connected to anything broader or is this just a fun intellectual exercise? Um, so we're, we're going to connect this to abstract algebra. That's kind of the, the goal of some of the research I've done. Uh, we're going to connect this to abstract algebra. Okay, so let's talk about ways of studying partitions. One way to study them is to visualize them, right? So we have these things called Young diagrams, and it's a diagram made up of squares where each row represents the parts in a partition. So for example, I could take this partition 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 and represent it as a row of 5 squares, a row of 3 squares, a row of 3 squares, a row of 3 squares, and a row of one square, right? So I can represent the partition using this sort of diagram. Um, I could take 9 plus 5 plus 3 plus 1 and represent this way. So I have 9 squares, 5 squares, 3 squares, 1 square. Um, if I have a partition like 5, I just write a row of 5 squares, right? So this is an example of this type of partition. Um, there are things I can do with these diagrams. There's this idea of conjugation. So I take this partition from earlier, this 9 plus 5 plus 3 plus 1, and what I can do is I can take what's called the conjugate. So I'm going to take all the rows and write them as columns. So this is in some sense, it looks like um, taking the transpose of a matrix, right? So I take this row of nine squares 
and write it as a column of nine squares. I take this row of five squares and write it as a column of five squares. Row of three squares, write it as a column of three squares. And then row of one square, write it as a column of one square. But I notice when I count these diagrams, I always count how many things are in a row. So I've taken this partition nine plus five plus three plus one and transformed it into four plus three plus three plus two plus two plus one plus one plus one plus one. All right, so this would be called the conjugate partition. So if I start with nine plus five plus three plus one, it's conjugate is this expression here, four plus three plus three plus two plus two plus one plus one plus one plus one, plus one right? Um, so this is what I, I would call the conjugate. Um, there are certain partitions that are, that are self-conjugate, meaning when I conjugate them, I get the same exact partition back, right? So if I look at this diagram, this partition four plus three plus two plus one, and I take its conjugate, so, I take this first row of four, write it as a column of four. I take this next row of three, write it as a column of three. I take this row of two, write it as a column of two. And I take this one and write it as a one. I notice that, oh, I get back four plus three plus two plus one. So I would call this partition self-conjugate. Um, so this is a type of operation I can do on partition. And you might ask, well, what, what can I do with this operation? What can I prove with this operation? Or can I say anything about you know, maybe I'm interested in studying self-conjugate partitions, right? If I have a number n, how many self-conjugate partitions does n have? Well, let's talk about some, some theorems that pop up. So the number of partitions of n, so this is, this is kind of a well-known theorem as a really cool proof that I'm going to demonstrate. The number of partitions of n into parts that are both odd and distinct. So I want to use parts that are odd numbers, and I want to make sure I don't repeat any of my odd numbers. So 9 plus 5 plus 3 plus 1 is a good example because all those parts are odd and I haven't repeated any of my odd numbers. Um, so the number of ways I can partition n into odd and distinct parts is actually equal to the number of self-conjugate partitions of n. So there's a bijection between those two sets. So if I write down all the, all the partitions of n into distinct and odd parts and all the partitions of n into self-conjugate or all the self-conjugate partitions of n rather, I'd be able to write a bijection between those sets, a one-to-one -one and onto function. Okay, so here's a sketch of an example behind this proof. So the bijection actually works by taking one type of partition and transforming it into the other, right? So I'm gonna kind of show this. So I'm looking at on the left-hand side, I have this nine plus five plus three plus one. And how am I gonna transform this? I'm going to take this first row and I'm going to fold it in the middle and create this type of thing. I'm going to take the second row, I'm going to fold it and tuck it in. I'm going to take the third row, I'm going to fold it and I'm going to tuck it in. And then I'm gonna take that D and just tuck it into that ex extra space. And notice the thing that I got back was this partition five plus four plus four plus four plus one. And this partition is self-conjugate. So if I take a partition with odd and distinct parts, I can always fold it into a self-conjugate partition. The interesting thing about this is this is invertible. So if I have a self-conjugate partition, I can unfold it into a partition into odd and distinct parts. So I have this kind of one-to-one -one and onto correspondence. I have this way of going back, back and forth between these two types of partitions, right? So this kind of explains why these two sets have the same number of elements. Okay, so this is kind of like a diagram proof of this type of statement. Um, there are other methods that don't involve diagrams. They involve what are called generating functions. Um, and these, to me, are by far more interesting, personally. Um, they're less combinatorial. They're more, I don't know, I feel like more like I'm manipulating equations. They, they kind of, to me, they, they feel better to work with. So the idea is, what is a generating function? A generating function is just a power series. And the coefficients are just some kind of sequence. Um, in, in this theory, the, uh, the variable we use is going to be called q. So, you know, normally when you study power series, let's say you're, you're taking calculus two or something, you would study them in the variable X. Here, we're gonna use the variable Q. Um, so the study of partitions using generating functions, it was initiated by Euler. Um, it's one of the primary tools used in the study of partitions today. Um, generating func function techniques are interesting because they can be used to prove results about partitions um, and only involve manipulating equations. So you don't need to think about bijections, you don't need to think too much necessarily about combinatorial arguments or things like that. You just need to um, manipulate some equations oftentimes. And we'll do an example of this. We'll do one of Euler's famous proofs. Um, unlike the diagram approach, there's one drawback. 
um, it usually doesn't tell us why the two classes of partitions are equinumerous. So it tells us that a bijection exists between the two sets, but it doesn't tell us, oftentimes it doesn't tell us anything about what that bijection is. So there is a drawback. Um, it's more elegant mathematically in my opinion, but it doesn't tell us um, you know, why, why, why these two sets are the same. Um, it doesn't tell us how to manipulate diagrams or transform one type of partition into another, like, just like we, we did with the um, self-conjugate and odd distinct parts, right? That was a transformation of one type of partition into another. Um, these Q series or these uh, generating function methods don't often tell us any of this kind of stuff. Um, we begin with the following series. So I'm going to write down something that looks like this, and I'll kind of go into de detail what this is. I'm going to look at the product of 1 over 1 minus Q to the K, where k is bigger than or equal to 1. And if I write out its first few terms, this is what they look like. So let's kind of examine um, what this series is. But let, let's kind of explain what the heck I'm actually doing here. How did I transform the thing on the left into the thing on the right? Um, so the idea is we're going to interpret 1 over 1 minus q as the, as the geometric series, 1 plus q plus q squared plus so on and so forth. So it's an infinite sum. And what we're doing is we're viewing these as formal power series in the ring of power series, right? So the idea is that this geometric series is the multiplicative inverse of one minus Q, meaning that when I take one minus Q times this geometric series, I get one, right? So anytime we see a one over one minus Q, we're interpreting it as this geometric series. And again, remember Q is our variable instead of X. Um, so we have the following. If I look at this product, one over one minus Q to the K, well, Oh, this should be k greater than or equal to 1, my apologies, a small typo. Um, this should be 1 over 1 minus q, that's k equal to 1. 1 over 1 minus q squared, that's k equal to 2. 1 over 1 minus q cubed, so on and so forth. So I'm just multiplying all of these guys together. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this first one as a geometric series, expand the second one as a geometric series, expand the third one as a geometric series, so on and so forth, right? So if I expand them, here's what they look like. Um, this first one, 1 over 1 minus q, it's 1 plus q, plus q squared, plus q cubed, so on and so forth. So it's just this expression that we have up here. Um, I'm purposely writing q squared as q to the 1 plus 1. I'm purposely writing q cubed as q to the 1 plus 1 plus 1. Um, 1 over 1 minus q squared is this geometric series. It's 1 plus q squared plus q to the 4 plus q to the 6, so on and so forth. 1 over 1 minus q cubed is this guy right here. 1 over 1 minus q to the 4th is this guy right here, and so on and so forth. So this is an infinite product of these series. Um, one thing that's interesting is this is actually a power series. If you multiply this out, um, this does give you another power series back. But the question you might ask is, well, what power series is this exactly? Right? Like, what, what the heck am I looking at? Why are we looking at this? Um, so what I'm going to ask is, what is the coefficient of q to the n? And to study the coefficient of q to the n, I, I, I'm going to just kind of look at q to the fourth as an example. Um, so let's think about how many ways we can form q to the fourth. One thing we can do is how, how, how can q to the fourth arise? I can do 1 times 1 times 1 times q to the fourth and then times 1 times 1 times 1, so on and so forth. Or I can do like, q, you know, 1 times q to the 2 plus 2 times 1 times 1, so on and so forth. Or I can do q to the 1 plus 1 times q squared times 1 times 1, so on and so forth. So I have all these ways of forming uh, q to the fourth. Well, how many are there? Well, it, there are this many. So I noticed that one way I can do it is q to the 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, so on and so forth. I can do, like I said before, q to the 1 plus 1 times q squared times 1 times 1, so on and so forth. I can do q to the 1 times 1 times q cubed times 1, so on and so forth with the 1s. I can do 1 times q to the 2 plus 2 times 1 times 1, so on and so forth. Or I can do 1 times 1 times 1 times q to the 4 times 1 times 1. Um, one thing you might notice is that that's the only way, those are the only five ways we can form q to the fourth. And one thing you might notice is that these actually correspond to the number of partitions of 4. Right? So the first, first way of forming q to the fourth corresponds to partition 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. The second corresponds to 1 plus 1 plus 2. The third is 1 plus 3. The fourth is 2 plus 2, and the fifth one is q to the 4, which is 4. And so what do we notice? What's the coefficient of q to the 4? Well, we can form q to the 4 five different ways, so the coefficient of q to the 4 is going to be 5. And what is that? That's actually p of 4. It's the number of partitions of 4. So it turns out that if I want to form q to the n, the number of ways I can do it is the same as the number of partitions of n. 
right? So we can write down um, this beautiful equation that this product of one over one minus q to the k is just the sum of p of n q to the n. So the coefficient of q to the n is just the number of partitions of n. So it's a very, very beautiful observation. Um, I think it was Euler that first made this observation, and Euler used this to study partitions. And like I said, I want to go through one of Euler's super elegant proofs, because it's one of my favorite proofs in this theory. Okay, so what if I want to restrict my parts, right? So for example, if I go back and look here, I'm using th the ones in my partition are coming from this first product, or rather this first sum. The twos are coming from this part. The threes are coming from this part. The fours are coming from this part. Right, and the fives and the sixes come later on. Um, what if I don't want to look at odd parts, or rather, what if I don't want to use even parts? What if I only want to use odd parts? How can I modify this? Well, if I want to use only odd parts, I would cross out this term with the q squareds in it, and the q to the four, and the q to the six. I would cross out this term right here, right? And I would only keep the part, the the parts of the product that you know introduce threes, introduce ones. Uh, after this, you have one that introduces fives, so on and so forth. Um, so we're going to define two functions. We're going to say a function d of n is the number of partitions of n into distinct parts. So distinct meaning that no part can occur more than once, so no parts repeat. And o of n is the number of partitions of n into odd parts. So I can write down some, some examples of this. So how many partitions of n are there into distinct parts? So I'm not allowed any part to repeat. Oh, I have 10, 1 plus 9, 2 plus 8, 3 plus 7, 4 plus 6, 1 plus 2 plus 7, 1 plus 3 plus 6, uh, 1 plus 4 plus 5, 1, 2 plus 3 plus 5, and 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, right? This gives me, um, there are 10 of these, so I would say d of 10 is equal to 10. It's the number of partitions of 10 into distinct parts. Again, no parts are allowed to repeat, meaning I'm not allowed like a 1 plus 1 or a 2 plus 2 or anything like that. Um, what if I want to use only odd parts? Well, if I want to partition 10 and use only odd parts, I have 1 plus 9, 3 plus 7, 5 plus 5, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 7. Remember, this is odd parts. This allows, you know, we're allowed to repeat things here. We just want to make sure we don't use like 2s or 4s or 6s or something like that. So 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 7 is okay. 1 plus 1 plus 3 plus 5 is okay. And so on and so forth. And I notice that once I write all these out, there's 10 ways of doing this, right? There are 10 partitions of 10 where I'm only using odd parts. And you might say, oh, that's interesting. There's the same number of things on this side as there is on this side. Um, and it turns out if you do this for any number n, then these two lists will always have the same number of items. If I look at the number of partitions of a million into distinct parts and the number of partitions of a million into odd parts, I would have the same number of things on this side as I would on this side. Right. So we have our first kind of, part, or I guess our second, we already did this thing with the self-conjugate partitions. We have our second partition, partition identity, namely that d of n is always equal to o of n. Um, there is a bijective proof between these. There is a way of taking one of these types of partitions and transforming it into one of these. But I, I want to go over the generating function way of proving it because I, I feel it's far more elegant. Um, so this is what's called Euler's theorem. The number of partitions of n into distinct parts is equal to the number of partitions of n into odd parts. Um, so d of n is equal to o of n for all n greater than or equal to 0. So how does the proof go? So the proof is super elegant. Um, <clears throat> as generating functions, we have the following. So if I want to use distinct parts, I want to make sure no parts repeat. So I can have a 1 plus a q to the 1, but I want to chop off that q to the 1 plus 1. I want to chop off that q to the 1 plus 1 plus 1, so on and so forth. So I want to include 1 plus q to the 1, but no terms after it, because the terms after it included a q to the 1 plus 1, a q to the 1 plus 1 plus 1, so on and so forth. Um, I also want to make sure no 2s repeat. So anything with a 2 plus 2 and higher, I want to chop off. So I'll just keep a 1 plus q squared, but chop off everything else. Um, same thing with 3s. I don't want 3 plus 3s and higher. Um, same thing with 4s. And same thing with everything else. So d of n is actually equal to the product of 1 plus q to the k, where k is greater than or equal to 1. Right? So, so th this is what this generating function looks like. Um, so that's how I control to make sure I don't have any repeating parts, make sure I have distinct parts. Um, how do I get odd parts? Well, I form the same thing as before, but I just remove all the even pieces like we mentioned earlier. So I removed all the twos, I removed all the fours, I removed all the sixes, so on and so forth. So I have one over one minus q, one over one minus q cubed, one over one minus q to the fifth, so on and so forth. And I might notice that um, this is just the product of one over one minus q to the 2k plus 1, where k is bigger than or equal to 0. So I get this generating function. 
And now my claim is that these two are actually equal to one another, these two functions. And if they're equal to one another, that must mean their coefficients are equal to one another, because that's what it means for two formal power series to be equal. It means they have the same coefficients. Okay, so let's prove this. The proof is super elegant. So this is Euler's beautiful proof. Um, let's go through this line by line. So d of n, q to the n, the sum of these guys, this was equal by the above, right? That's this equation right here. It's the product of one plus q to the k, where k is bigger than or equal to one. Okay, I can write one plus q to the k, this, this product, th this term right here, as one minus q to the two k over one minus q to the k, right? So I can factor this. This is a difference of squares. If I cancel out um, the numerator and denominator, I get back to here, right? So I can rewrite this guy this way, right? One minus q to the two k is one minus q to the k times one plus q to the k. Um, so I get this type of thing. And now I'm going to write out all of these terms. So if k equals 1, I get 1 minus q squared over 1 minus q. If k equals 2, I get 1 over q to the 1 minus q to the 4th over 1 minus q squared. If k equals 3, I get this term, so on and so forth. What I might start noticing is that certain things cancel. I might notice that 1 minus q squared here cancels with 1 minus q squared here. I might notice 1 minus q to the 4th here can be canceled with 1 minus q to the 4th here. I might notice that 1 minus q to the 6th will be canceled with 1 minus q to the 6th. And eventually, if I keep going, I'll notice that the whole numerator cancels out, right? This whole numerator cancels out. What's going to be left over? A 1 minus q, 1 minus q cubed, 1 minus q to the 5th, 1 minus q to the 7th, so on and so forth, right? So the odds remain in the denominator. So what, what's the product that's left over? It's the product of 1 over 1 minus q to the 2k plus 1. But wait a second, that's familiar. That's just the generating function for odd parts, right? That's this guy. So I've shown that this sum is equal to this sum, right? This formal series is equal to this formal series, which means that their coefficients have to be the same. That means for every n, d of n must equal o of n. So this is Euler's beautiful proof of this theorem. Um, notice it doesn't give us a bijection. It doesn't tell me how to take a partition with odd parts and transform it into a partition with distinct parts or anything like that, but it's a super elegant proof to show you that, oh yeah, these two things are indeed the same. Okay. So let's talk about the rogers ramanujan identities a little bit. Um, so this is kind of an extension of the identities that we just studied. Um, so these say the number of partitions of n where the difference between parts is two or larger. So that means we can't have something like a one plus two because the difference between one and two is just one. We have to have like a one plus three plus, you know, the next number has to be at least two larger than three. Um, so th these types of partitions. Um, is equal to the number of partitions of n where all the parts are taken from 1, 4, 6, 9, 11, 14, 16, 19, so on and so forth. These are all the numbers whose remainder is 1 or 4 when you divide them by 5. So this is called the first rogers ramanujan identity. Um, so let's look at this re really quickly. So the, the partitions of 10 into parts with difference 2 or larger, there's 10. There's 1 plus 9. The difference between 1 and 9 is 2 or larger. 2 plus 8. The difference between 2 and 8 is 2 or larger. 3 plus 7. That meets our condition. 4 plus 6, the difference between 4 and 6 is 2, or larger. Um, and there's 1 plus 3 plus 6. The difference between 1 and 3 is 2 or larger, and the difference between 3 and 6 is 2 or larger. So those are all the partitions I can generate. Um, if I want to look at the partitions of 10 using parts from the set, so these are numbers, so the parts all have remainder 1 or 4 when you divide them by 5, I can do 1 plus 9, 4 plus 6, 1 plus 1 plus 4 plus 4, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 6, and then these two. Right. And I noticed I have one, two, three, four, five, six things here, and I have six things here. Right. So and, and again, I don't have to just do this for 10. I have, you know, I can pick any number and this is always going to happen. The number of partitions into parts that meet this difference two condition is equal to the number of partitions of an integer um, where my parts are chosen from this set. So this is actually incredibly difficult to prove. It's kind of interesting because it doesn't look that far removed from uh, Euler's identity, but this is actually a really hard theorem to prove. Um, as generating functions, we can just show this equality, right? So this side right here, again, it, it, it's kind of complicated to go through this, but this side right here captures our difference two condition. And this side right here captures our parts have to be able to form one plus five K or four plus five K. So they have remainder one or remainder four when you divide them by five. Right. So showing that this sum is equal to this product is how we would go about proving this identity. Um, this is highly non-trivial to show, and there are lots and lots of proofs of this since the early 1900s, but it's, it's, it's a very hard theorem. Um, there is a second rogers ramanujan identity. So now we have a difference to condition, and we don't allow any ones to appear. So if I, if I impose the same difference to condition as the previous slide, 
but I don't allow ones to appear either. Um, I'm also, the number of partitions of this type is equal to the number of partitions of n, where all the parts are taken from the set 2, 3, 7, 8, 12, 13, so on and so forth. These are just the numbers whose remainder is 2 or 3 when I divide them by 5, right? And so, for example, if I want to take the partitions of 10 into parts with the difference 2 condition, but now I'm not allowed to use 1s, I get 10, 2 plus 8, 3 plus 7, 4 plus 6. Our, our 1 plus 3 plus 6, for example, drops out because it uses a 1, and I'm not allowed to use 1s. Um, what about the number of partitions of 10 using elements of this set? There's 3 plus 7, there's 5 twos, there's 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3, and there's 2 plus 8. That's it. I notice there's four of them here, and there's four of them here. And if I do this for any integer, any positive integer n, I'll always get the same number of things on this side and the same number of things on this side. So this can be summed up as a Q-series. Um, the Q-series looks something like this. So on the right-hand side, this is capturing the 2 or 3 mod 5 condition, that the parts have to have remainder 2 or 3 when I divide by 5. This left-hand side is capturing this difference 2 and no ones appearing condition. And again, why this is the case is, is pretty complicated. <clears throat> um, this is also highly non-trivial to show, right? Both of these identities are, are pretty hard to show. So a little bit about Ramanujan. Um, if, if you haven't heard of him before, Srinivasa Ramanujan. Um, so he's a mathematical project prodigy, absolute mathematical genius. Um, so at the age of 15, he studied from Carr's synopsis of elementary results in pure and applied math. So the book contained very few proofs of results or just very brief proofs, um, but it did inspire him to develop his own theorems and ideas. Um, I don't think it gave him a good sense of what rigorous proofs look like and things like that, but it, he went through and verified the results in the book and kind of inspired him to come up with his own ideas. Um, he attended the University of Madras in 1903, but he lost his scholarship to attend because he neglected, neglected all of his non-mathematics courses, right? Um, so I think he, he left the university um, shortly after starting there. Um, but his genius began to be recognized in India around 1909. Um, in 1913, he sent letters to mathematicians at Cambridge, but the first two went unanswered. Um, he was eventually recognized by G.H. Hardy at Cambridge in 1913 and brought to Cambridge in 1914. And in these letters, he sent nine pages of mathematics to Hardy. So some of the results Hard Hardy already knew, but some of them were completely astonishing, completely like shocking, brand new things that mathematicians in, in the West had not seen before. Um, so G.H. Hardy actually had an interesting remark. His reaction when he read this letter um, to some, uh, to his reaction to some of the equations in this letter. He said, they defeated me completely. I had never seen anything in, in the least like them before. A single look at them is enough to show that they could only have been written by a mathematician of the highest class. They must be true because if they were not true, no one could have had the imagination to invent them. Um, and here's actually an interesting thing. Hardy had this uh, rating system for mathematicians from zero to 100, I found out. Um, he gave himself a 25, he gave his, his colleague Littlewood a 30, he gave Hilbert an 80, and he gave Ramanujan a perfect 100, right? So this is, this, this is, this is how Hardy felt about, about Ramanujan. Um, and Ramanujan, he left behind thousands of results. Um, the vast majority of this, these results were proved to be correct, um, and many of them still inspire mathematical research to this day. Right, so to this day, we're still talking about Ramanujan's results, his equations, generalizations of his results, things like that. So absolutely brilliant mathematician. Um, okay, so how are these two areas that I've just talked about, um, abstract algebra and number theory related? Um, and what does it mean for both disciplines? So um, the Rogers Ramanujan identities actually appear in a number of places. They appear in other areas of number theory. So for example, the study of modular forms they appear in statistical mechanics, in particular in the hard hexagon model. Um, they appear in Lie algebra and vertex algebra theory. Um, one of the original motivations that led to the development of the vertex algebra theory in the 80s was the mysterious, of, mysterious appearance of the Rogers Ramanujan identities in the study of Lie algebras. So, algebraic structures like Lie algebras often act on vector spaces, and those vector spaces are called modules. Um, it turns out that these modules, these vector spaces are infinite dimensional, but you can decompose them into smaller finite dimensional pieces. Um, it turns out when you study the dimensions of these finite dimensional pieces, they're very closely tied to the Rogers Ramanujan identity, and the question is why, right? So this connection was totally new and unclear about 40 years ago or so. Um, vertex algebras were actually used to explain and provide a new proof of the Rogers Ramanujan identities. Um, using only techniques from representation theory. And this was done by Lepowski and Wilson. Um, so 
they provided a new proof of the Rogers Romano John identities without using number theory techniques. They just used Lie algebra theory, vertex algebra theory, and representation theory results. Um, extending these results has led to and continues to lead to the discovery of new partition identities. So um, Caporelli's identities is a set of partition identities that came up from or came out from um, extending some of the results of Lepowski and Wilson. Recently, Nandi's identities um, are also a set of identities that arose from extending these kinds of works. And there's still tons of uh, stuff to explore there, right? So for example, how can we extend these further? It turns out that when you study certain Lie algebras and certain modules, you get the results of Lepowski and Wilson. If you study um, other modules for these Lie algebras, you might get Caporelli and Nandi, but there's still an infinity, an infinite number of things left to do, what identities might arise from there? And this is actually a really hard problem. So even like Nandi's identities are very, very difficult to derive. Um, but the thing is there are still identities to be discovered. It's just a question of what are they? <laughs> um, how do we even tackle this? Um, so a little bit about technical detail. So I kind of wanna, I guess for, for, for I guess the more uh, mathematically inclined in the audience, just give a slide or two about some, some details about the, these, um, this bridge between these disciplines. Um, so for people who might have more math background. So finite dimensional Lie algebras over the complex numbers and their finite dimensional modules are very well understood, right? They're all classified. Everything is, is fairly well understood. Um, there are, there's a class called affine Lie algebras. So affine Lie algebras are these infinite dimensional Lie algebras, which behave enough like finite dimensional Lie algebras um, that we can study them and say a lot about them. So in general, infinite dimensional Lie algebras are very, very hard to study. Um, there are a lot of classes of infinite dimensional Lie algebras that we can't say very much about, but affine Lie algebras are the ones that kind of behave well enough that we can still say a lot about them. Um, the modules for these, the irreducible modules are cyclic, which means they're generated by the Lie algebra acting on a single vector. So there's a, there's a vector in this vector space that generates the entire structure when the Lie algebra acts on it. Um, so certain modules for these affine Lie algebras can be given the structure of a vertex operator algebra. So these are modules for the Lie algebra, but they also have the structure of a vertex operator algebra or a VOA, as I'll say. Um, and the other irreducible modules are VOA modules for this VOA that we've constructed, right? So uh, there's this underlying kind of like vertex algebraic structure in, in these Lie algebraic objects. And um, the vertex algebraic structure or the VOA structure will often be pretty revealing about um, some of the details in these in these um, in these modules. Um, in particular, uh, these modules have the action of what's called the Virasoro algebra on them. So anytime you're dealing with a vertex operator algebra or a module for a vertex operator algebra, there's an action of what's called the Virasoro algebra. Um, I think Michael Michael recently did a video on this Virasoro algebra. That was pretty interesting. Um, but these Virasoro algebras are kind of like built into the structure of a VOA. Um, specifically, there's this operator called L0. Um, in this, in this Virasoro algebra that acts on all of these vector spaces. Um, and what this operator does is it allows us to decompose these modules into finite dimensional eigenspaces. So this, the, these L of zero operators have eigenvalues. They're often integers or rational numbers depending on um, the space they're acting on. And their eigenspaces are finite dimensional. So I can take this big infinite dimensional vector space and decompose it to an infinite sum of finite dimensional vector spaces. Um, these eigenvalues, we call them conformal weights. Um, so for example, if V is a vertex operator algebra module, we can de decompose V into something like this. Um, so the eigenvalues might be like zero, one, two, they might be positive integers, they might be rational numbers, um, but we have a decomposition and each of these spaces is finite dimensional. So a lot of what mathematicians in VOA theory might try to do is ask this question of, well, what are the dimensions of these pieces? Right, um, so we're interested in the dimensions of these eigenspaces. Um, so the vertex algebras and modules I and many others, including Michael and a bunch of our colleagues have studied in the past, they're called principal subspaces. Um, so basically you have this vector V that generates an, the entire module. And instead of having the entire affine Lie algebra act on V to generate the entire module, you just take a subalgebra of the affine Lie algebra to act on V. So um, you get some subspace of your original module. Um, but importantly, they also have an eigenspace decomposition that looks like this, right? Um, so the, f the easiest example of a principal subspace, so it was shown by Fagan and Stoyanovsky, um, to have its graded dimension, or if I, if I take these dimensions and kind of put them as coefficients of Q to the N, 
they look something like this, right? And when I say easiest example, I mean for the affine Lie algebra SL2 hat. Um, so it's built on kind of like the smallest finite dimensional simple Lie algebra. So it's kind of like really the easiest example of an affine Lie algebra. Um, and the thing that is interesting about this series is it turns out that these dimensions actually correspond exactly with the rogers ramanujan identities. So the dimension of V sub 5 is the number of partitions of 5 into uh, parts that have that difference to condition, for example. So we have this, this beautiful connection um, between these two. So it was originally uh, found in this work of Fagan and Stoyanovsky. Um, and this was done for certainly algebras like SL2 and SL3, SL2 hat and SL3 hat and things like that. And ever since then, it's been extended to all sorts of um, different Lie algebras. Um, so the next question to ask is, is there more to do, right? You see this paper that they write, they write it for SL2, they write it for SL3. You might say, oh, well, these same results for S hold for SLN, but I know that there are more Lie algebras. So what if I try to do this for other kinds of Lie algebras? Um, so this has been done by tons of mathematicians. I kind of want to focus on a uh, certain uh, subset of the work done by uh, myself and my colleagues, but there are physicists and mathematicians from all over the place that have also contributed to a lot of this work. Um, so the answer is yes, there's more to do. Um, the study of principal subspaces using certain vertex al al operator algebraic ideas, so namely we construct short exact sequences between these structures to uh, try to find these graded dimensions, um, has been developed by in detail by many authors, so Kalinescu, Caparelli, Lepowski, Milos, Penn, myself, and many others. Um, so one way to atta attack this problem is to try to find the recursion that's satisfied by this generating function and then solve that recursion to figure out what these coefficients are. Um, and that kind of is the idea behind a lot of this work. Um, physicists and other mathematicians have done work as well constructing bases, right? Another way to, to kind of get at these dimensions is to construct the basis for these vector spaces, right? If you, have a, if you know how many things are in your basis, you know what the dimension of your vector space is. Um, so that's another approach. Um, and there, there are plenty of others. So I'm, I'm not saying that this is a comprehensive list by any means. There are tons of people that have worked on this problem and continue to work on these types of problems. Um, and, and also principal subspaces are just an example of the types of things you might want to do this for. There are other vertex operator algebras that these kinds of problems arise for as well. Um, so other partition identities have been interpreted in the language of vertex algebras. So generalizations of the rogers ramanujan identities um, appeared when you study certain modules for SL2 hat. Um, these were originally noticed by Fagan and Stoyanovsky. Um, we, a few years ago, we made a conjecture that um, if you look at the twisted affine Lie algebra A22 and you study the graded dimension of those principal subspaces, um, you get the Golnitz, Gordon, Andrews identities. Um, Again, this is still a conjecture. This hasn't been proved, um, but it's a, it's a conjecture in a, pen, in, in a paper by Kalinescu, Penn, and myself, right? Um, so now the question is, how do we prove it? Um, one way might be to construct the basis for that principal subspace. Another way might be to find the recursion. We were unable to find the recursion, um, but find the recursion and solve it. Um, so there's an open problem right there. And then the question is, well, what if I apply this, these ideas to other Lie algebras? Um, do they extend? Do they not extend? Um, so there's still many open problems. In particular, the techniques that we've used um, haven't really been extended to modules beyond what are called basic modules, so what are called level one representations. Um, but there are level k representations where k is any positive integer. Um, and there are also other representations as well. So we've only kind of like um, done what we could, but maybe someday someone will extend these techniques further or maybe show that they don't work for higher level representations or other representations. But there's still there's still an open problem sitting there, um, okay, and that's that's where I want to stop. So <laughs> thank you for listening, um, thank you for being in the audience, and I guess I, sh I should take some questions. Um, let me actually throw throw the host thing back to Michael.